Hey there, welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, and today we've got a treat. We're going to talk to Warren all about reflexive performance reset. And just a heads up, we've got more great guests coming up on the podcast. I literally just got back in town here from the International Society of Sports Nutrition Conference down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Amazing time. Uh, if you followed some of my stuff on Instagram, which is just uh, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, so D R M I K E T N E L S O N, I was trying to post a bunch of summaries of the studies there. But that was awesome to see everyone, and hopefully, I'll see some more of you out there next year. I did get to meet a couple of you at the conference, so thank you for coming up and saying hi. Really appreciate that. And today, the podcast is brought to you by Physiologic Flexibility. You can go to physiologicflexibility.com, and you can get on the wait list and get all the information for the next time we open the certification. So if you're pretty good at nutrition and recovery, you've got a solid exercise program, and you're wondering what are the next advanced things you should be doing to increase your ability to recover, resilience, being more anti-fragile, and just generally being harder to kill. I would check out the Physiologic Flexibility Certification. Go to physiologicflexibility.com. And today we're talking all things RPR, Reflexive Performance Reset. You may or may not uh, have heard of it. Uh, I initially heard about it through my buddy, uh, Coach Cal Dietz, here at the University of Minnesota, going back, man, has it been seven years now, I think? Somewhere around there. I'm losing track of time. Probably longer than that, even. Um, and I initially took the training from Doug Keel, uh, who does a B-Activated training. So how it started is, uh, I think Cal found out about it through uh, Chris Corfus. And he had Doug come over from South Africa to teach in the U.S. So I took one of the certifications that Doug taught for Level 1 and 2 of the Activated Training. And it was so useful that uh, Cal, GL, and Chris got a license from Doug to teach his material as RPR, Reflexive Performance Reset, uh, but was teaching it to strength coaches and personal trainers. So the material does overlap a fair amount. Uh, so be activated training right now is taught by Doug and his staff. And that's generally more of the medical model. So uh, physicians, assistants, physical therapists, chiropractors, MDs, etc. Uh, that's taught as a more hands-on based uh, model for body work. And then if you're a trainer or strength coach in that realm, that's billed as RPR, Reflexive Performance Reset. And then you have the clients do the drills on themselves. So I do kind of a hybrid here in Minnesota. So I'll do some of the body work on people and then testing. And then I'll have them leave and do the drills on their own. So that's usually the most common question. So I know sometimes in the podcast here, I use terms a little bit uh, interchangeably and that does get confusing. So Warren had some uh, brand new research on RPR, so I wanted to get him on the podcast and go through what he did in his study, what did he find, and just overall a general discussion about RPR and its, its effects. In terms of disclosures, I have, I guess, one disclosure with RPR. Uh, I do teach for them on occasion. Uh, I've taught uh, level one and level two several times in the past, especially uh, before COVID, and I currently don't have an affiliate link or anything like that. So if you go to the course or if you sign up, don't make any money off that. But if I do happen to teach, then obviously I get paid uh, to teach. So I do have some vested interest in it that way. Um, I do do sessions here in person in Minnesota, and I've had people from yeah all over uh, stop by and, and fly in to do sessions. So. I found it to be super beneficial, uh, but again, with stuff that's brand new, uh, it's always nice to look at the research and what it is based upon so we can get a better idea of potentially how we could make it better and possibly understanding some of the mechanisms too. So enjoy this podcast with Warren about all things RPR and brand new research in that area. 
Hey, what's going on? Uh, welcome to the Flex Diet Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, and we're here today to talk about some RPR, Reflexive Performance Reset. We have a special guest, so if you want to just say a short introduction about yourself there and how you got into RPR. Sure. I am uh, Warren Bartlett from Plymouth State University in Plymouth, New Hampshire, and I'm in a master's graduate program of exercise science and I also did my undergraduate at Plymouth State. I did track and field for four years um, and I'm a big RPR proponent and practitioner. Uh, I'm a CSCS uh, personal trainer and yeah I think that spell covers all of it. Nice nice. And so how did you originally hear about RPR? Yeah, so uh, I think I originally heard it um, through Cal Dietz uh, after mm-hmm. reading Triphasic. And I, I watched it on YouTube and I didn't really believe it. I just, you know, watching the video it didn't really look real. So then <laughs> Which I, video I, did you find? Like people trying to poke around on themselves know, just, just, just and do weird stuff? <laughs> Yeah, like you would see Cal, um, you know, doing the resets on people and all of a sudden they're stronger and it just didn't really make sense to me at the time. So then I did the uh, certification, the level one and two with uh, JL Holdsworth in Connecticut. Nice. And yeah, so I did that. Uh, what originally happened was I got Achilles tendonitis in my ankle and I couldn't run my last season of, uh, of track in college. And so what really convinced me, I guess, convinced me on RPR was I did it on myself and it profoundly worked and significantly improved my Achilles tendonitis. Hmm. And that's when I went to grad school. I was like, I gotta, I gotta put some research behind this and see if, does it only work on one person? to work on multiple people you know let's let's get something behind this very cool and how would you describe rpr for people listening who are like rpr what i don't understand i've never heard of this like how would you describe it to them yeah um when i write my scientific studies and in papers i describe it similar to acupressure and acupressure is a two thousand year old chinese medicine that essentially involves applying pressure point, applying the pressure around points around the body. And it, it's similar, uh, maybe not necessarily in the pressure points, but in, in theory, it's similar. Cool. And what is the benefit for that? So if someone's a strength and conditioning professional, they're like, ah, yeah, I can poke around on myself, but what's like kind of the benefit from it? Sure. Well, just based on the ac- the current literature on acupressure, acupressure has shown to decrease pain in elderly populations. It's shown to increase shoulder mobility in older populations. Um, and that's just acupressure. Right now there's limited research in RPR un- until, you know, until my study really gets published and, and peer reviewed. Um, but it could potentially have benefits in flexibility and strength gains for your strength and conditioning professionals. Cool. And is this something they can do on themselves then it sounds like? I know there's two different forms. There's RPR versus kind of the B activated training. Yeah. So I'm not as familiar with B activated, but they did talk about it. Um, RPR is intended to be done by the person themselves. And from my understanding, be activated is more of a clinician, uh, clinician base where the person is doing it on another person. Um, so RPR is done on oneself and really doesn't take a lot of time to perform. And it's pretty easy to be done. Nice. <clears throat> yeah. And my bias obviously is I teach once in a while for RPR and then I originally heard about it from from Cal and he had me go to the first training that Doug Heal did of the be activated training at that time so I was <clears throat> god I think I was still doing my was I still doing my PhD at that time I can't remember now like all the time seemed to just like, fall together but 
uh, he's like, Hey, I got this guy coming in from South Africa. You got to go to this training I'm doing. And I'm just like, I, I don't, I don't know about this. I'm like, well, what is it? He's like, crazy shit, man. Crazy shit. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Like how much is this? <clears throat> it's like, Oh, it's like $1,500 for two days. I'm like, when is it? It's like June. This is like January. And if it had been like anybody else, I'd be like, no, I'm not giving you $1,500 to have some crazy guy. I don't even know. Talk about a system that I don't understand at all. But I'm like, well, Cal's been generally right about most things in the past. So I'm like, sure, whatever. And so that was the first time, I think a second time Doug had taught uh, Be Activated training in the US. And he condensed the level one down into one day and level two into one day. And that was pretty, pretty profound. And then after that, I know uh, Cal and Chris Corfus and JL uh, got a license from Doug to teach his material as RPR, Reflexive Performance Reset. Mm -hmm. And exactly what you said, the differentiation there is that <clears throat> you're teaching it to strength and conditioning people, physical um, trainers, and kind of a non-medical model. So each person can apply it to themselves. And then Doug still kind of teaches his version of the model, which is a little bit more to medical professionals, you know, physical therapists, chiropractors, massage therapists, et cetera. So. Right. Cool. So what have other results have you seen just kind of anecdotally from RPR? Mm. Well, I mean, there's most profound was my experience was it, you know, essentially cured my Achilles tendonitis, which was, you know, debilitating. I, uh, so kind of walk us through, like, what did that look like? Did you, you just kind of watched a bunch of videos and you're like, I don't know, I'm just going to poke around on myself here. And like, how did that process come about? So this was after I did the certification. Okay. And I was running and my Achilles tendonitis flared back up. I was training really hard and I was in the middle of a, warming up for a workout on the track. And I was telling my, my buddy there, I'm like, man, I might not be able to do this workout. My, my Achilles is killing me. I might I almost can't run. Um, so I'm like, give me a second. I'm going to you know, try this RPR I just learned. And so I did the uh, calf reset. So going down the uh, side of the fibula and then directly behind the calf. I did that for about a minute. And I had my little RPR stick, which you know I bought for like $3. <laughs> mm -hmm. I find it helped a little bit to get really behind that calf muscle. Um, and then I went through all the level one, um, you know, zone one, two, and three. And then I did a couple of laps and, you know, almost miraculously, my Achilles did not hurt at all. And I went through the whole workout hmm. um, and it was incredible. Like, you know, they were talking about that in the conference, how tendonitis could potentially be laughed at in 20 years for the mechanism. Um, it's like, a you know, they always say it's a, uh, what, a mechanical lens and a uh, neurological lens. Um, so that's kind of their theory on it. Um, but that was my greatest experience with RPR. Um, with my study, it was really cool because I, I got to physically see the results of RPR working in front of me. I mean, as a, as a researcher, I just had to measure and not try to be biased at all, but you would see it right after you did the resets. This person had, you know, at least 10, five to 10 more degrees range of motion um, around their body. Yeah. So walk us through, you <clears throat> decided to do a research study on RPR. And then uh, before that point, did you, what is kind of the research state of what's been published so far on, on RPR in terms of uh, published work, I guess? Right. So current public literature, um, it's pretty limited. Uh, I found a couple graduate or doctoral theses that weren't really published. They still had to run stats on them. Um, there was one that looked at biceps femoris activation and step ups in RPR, uh, which I found interesting. Um, but it's, it's really limited in terms of what they're actually doing. So when I designed this study, I wanted to replicate the, the test in the pretest and the test exactly um, to kind of how they do it. So like the, the classic RPR video, you see the person hold their arm out, they, you know, test their strength and then they 
you know, run them through a couple things that make the arm drop down really fast. And then they do the RPR reset. And then all of a sudden they're stronger. I kind of want to demonstrate that um, in my study by showing, you know, a, a baseline and then a retest, which is kind of how I set mine out. Um, yeah. So walk us through that. Like, what did you use for baselines and then kind of what did you have for groups and that type of thing? Right. So baseline. Um, essentially the subject came in, not warmed up at all because RPR is essentially meant to be a warm up. They come in and I have my goniometer and we measured 11 different, uh, movements. We measured hip flexion, hip abduction, hip adduction, shoulder flexion, shoulder abduction on both right and left sides, uh, ankle inversion, ankle eversion ankle dorsiflexion, uh, ankle plantar flexion. And then we did right and left hand grip. I think that's all I'm trying to think here. I'll have it in front of me. So yeah, about 11 movements and we had them either go through acupressure, placebo or RPR. They did that for 10 minutes and then we re retested all of movements that we did initially it was 28 subjects all college age there was about 15 males and 13 females and the uh they were all general population subjects so they weren't really athletic if they were athletes they had to be um not in training and had to be a couple months away from you know from them vigorously training um I feel like I'm missing eight, something here. Yeah. So on the, as the three groups was one of them, you know, kind of designed to be like a sham group. Cause one of the arguments is that if you just have one group that does, I don't know, passive warm up for 10 minutes on a treadmill, right. I'm just making this up <clears throat> versus another group who does the RPR intervention. You could then argue and say, well, that it's just a placebo effect because the one group is doing something on themselves. The other group is just passively sitting in a sauna or just doing some type of general warm-up but it sounds like you had uh, three groups and one of them I'm assuming was kind of more like a sham where they're poking on pressing on different parts of their body but not necessarily the correct RPR targets right so no it wasn't that let me correct that um so the three groups the the person came in it was randomized so they, they either did RPR acupressure placebo had to wait 24 hours and then they did the next one, another 24 hours, and then they did the third one. So each subject got RPR, placebo, and acupressure over the course of, um, you know, the three-day time span. Um, obviously, with timing, sometimes they would, uh, you know, be out longer. But essentially, we're comparing oneself to oneself. So what is Warren's current self? So it didn't really matter if um, they were less flexible one day, you know, if they were less, less flexible, RPR was, would supposedly increase that anyways. Um, so I wasn't really concerned if um, like the, the measurements were significantly off, like they were really stiff from something. Uh, I controlled for, uh, you know, muscle soreness. So I told them not to partake in vigorous activity 24 hours before testing sessions. Um, I feel like I'm still missing something here. Help me out. Um, yeah. So there, you're looking at a sort of a randomized intervention controlled trial, right? So they come in, you're going to do your baseline and they're going to be randomized to either three, one of three conditions. And then you're going to look at the pre versus post per session. And then they'll go away. They'll come back. They'll get the other condition. They'll go away, come back and get the third um, condition. So you're looking at each person in comparison to the three different interventions you had, correct? Correct. And on the acupressure, what did that look like? Were they like, uh, what was the difference between the acupressure and the placebo? Right. So based on current literature, um, I saw what I expected to see, whereas the acupressure, which was at the ear. So there was two pressure points at both ears. So uh, two and a half minutes on four total ear pressure points. 
they showed significant increases in shoulder abduction uh, and shoulder flexion. Hmm. Uh, and that's what the, the current literature has shown in elderly populations that it did increase uh, shoulder, shoulder mobility. And it was by about 10 degrees on average um, with, with, with means. Um, so that was very cool seeing that. Um, RPR showed increases over placebo and acupressure on hip extension. Uh, shoulder flexion and abduction were not significantly increased over, over uh, acupressure, but over placebo. So clearly because um, acupressure increased shoulder mobility, RPR didn't, wasn't significant over that, but it was significant over placebo. Uh, hand grip was significantly affected on the right side with RPR. So I saw differences on RPR only worked on one side significantly over the other. So that could be a potential, I have no idea, but it could be potential um, future research topics down the road. Um, Do you know it, if they were right hand or left hand dominant? Did you have any left handed people in the study just out of curiosity? I've gotten that question a lot and I have not, uh, I did not record that. I could always go back through and, uh, and pull the subjects cause, um, I have all their contact information. Yeah. You could look at baseline strength, right versus left too, and see if it's always increasing in the hand, the comparison wise is stronger, which you could infer might be their dominant hand potentially too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, shoulder. Let me think here. Uh, hip flexion did not increase. Hip abduction increased with RPR. Hip adduction did not increase. Uh, dorsiflexion increased significantly with RPR. Uh, plantar flexion, not really, no really changes there. And ankle inversion and eversion, no real changes there. Um, so really, the main factors that RPR affected was hip extension, shoulder mobility, and hand grip from essentially what I found um, with both sides, the dorsiflexion and the hip abduction. Uh, those were only on one side and the hand grip was on one side. So why do you think there's kind of a one-sided uh, difference just out of curiosity, especially and it sounds like it showed up in other uh, lower body also? Mm. It could potentially be we're just dealing with such a small uh, degree of motion. Um, I'm not sure really. Uh, could be they needed to do the resets more. So it only got 10 minutes to do RPR. Okay. In future research, I'd like to see them maybe do repeated RPR, which I've seen in a, a current study that just came out. Um, but they do RPR and then, you know, retest, retest. They do it again, test, retest. You now, they said in the conference, RPR is like brushing your teeth. The more you do it, the better you get at it, which makes sense to me. You're going to be able to, you know, apply pressure better through, um, through those pressure points. I think that could potentially help. So, you know, I have to assume as a researcher, they were, they were doing it correctly. And they were doing it correctly because I was instructing them on that. But I think if they practiced at it, they'd get better at applying pressure. They would become more familiar with the exact points where I want them to be. Uh, so I think that could potentially change the right and left side discrepancy that I found. And so were you the one that was giving them instruction on how to do that for all of the subjects then? So it was the same person giving instruction? Yep. So I did all the research. I did... Uh, um, all the instruction and measurements so that since I did all the measurements that kind of reduces that, uh, inter-rater mm -hmm. uh, variability of measuring with a goniometer, uh, for RPR, I had a script. So everyone was getting the same cues and same, uh, message on how to do it. You know, it was all time. So each placebo got 10 minutes, uh, acupressure got 10 minutes and RPR got 10 minutes. And. I made sure to instruct belly breathing with RPR, which I found, I think a lot of the current studies that have come out on RPR, 
that did not show a significant difference, I don't think they were doing it correctly because they didn't instruct belly breathing, which they are huge on at the RPR conference is that you need the belly breathe to really make these resets work um, from what I've seen. And when I found maybe the subject struggled to belly breathe because I just could not get them to belly breathe, the RPR didn't really work on from what hmm. I saw in my study. Hmm. And that kind of, I guess, anecdotally matches kind of what I do. So I do a little bit more of the be activated model. So I'll work on people here in Minnesota and then I'll do all the baseline measurements pre. And usually what I've noticed over, God, when we've been doing this now, six years now, um, once I can kind of see their breathing be pretty good, right? So I tell people like, imagine your rib cage is like a balloon inflating 360 degrees, right? So once I get that full motion, especially up near the top, the ribs are not just on a hinge flopping up and down that everything else tends to go pretty fast from there. And it seems like they get anecdotally a better result and that those results tend to hold longer or, you know, again, it's comparison to when I started off earlier on, which probably didn't have as much skill. I didn't spend as much time doing breathing stuff. I've just noticed that everything seems to get better once that is better movement. But, you know, again, I have the luxury of, you know, most of the sessions I do are sometimes an hour and a half to two hours, you know, so I have the luxury of time and doing something kind of different per each individual that's in front of me too. For sure. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Cool. Would you recommend RPR to other people or what was kind of your takeaway from this? Yeah. So I think the, the big thing with RPR is allowing people to see what it does because once you start having someone karate chop their thighs they really start to question uh what they're really doing um so with rpr they do those buy-in tests and you know really allows you to see um what it does you know i saw how it worked on my ankle um but yeah i would suggest it to pretty much anyone it's really easy to do it only takes you know about five minutes to do I only do it um, before I work out. Um, RPR suggests you do it when you wake up, uh, before you work out, after you work out, and before you go to bed. Um, I don't really have trouble sleeping. They, they claim that it improves your sleep. So I don't really necessarily do it before I go to bed. Um, but I do always find when I do the behind the head occipital reset, uh, I tend to salivate, um, hmm. which would suggest to me I'm shifting into a parasympathetic state as they suggest. Um, but I think for my more academic folks, um, showing them the research that is currently coming out that this could have an effect on performance would be huge because now we're, we're speaking their language. You know, a lot of people um, are against RPR because they don't see the research. They think it's a, uh, they see the buy-in tests and the, the test retest with the arm. They, they're very skeptical, which I understand, you know, there's, but if you wait for the research, you're going to be going to be late. Um, you know, this is a, a pretty new topic um, in the strength and conditioning world. So if you're going to wait for, you know, 10, 20 years of research to come out to really back RPR, you're going to be late to the ball and, um, so that, that'd be my suggestion is try it out a lot. I think a lot of the skeptics that I've met have never actually tried RPR, um, which I find interesting because it's so easy to do. Um, but yes, I would suggest this to pretty much anyone. It's, it's really easy. Yeah. I mean, the first time I saw it, my reaction was this makes no sense whatsoever. This is like probably one of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my life. I'm like, there's no way that this is going to do anything. If it hadn't been, you know, Cal recommending it to me, I'd probably be like, uh, I, I don't know. But <clears throat> what I noticed even just after the first two days, it made like a huge difference, especially the uh, visual reset that Doug did on me made a huge difference in terms of my ability to uh, catch eye coordination. That kind of stuff was a lot better. Um, and then I actually, the first 
30 people I used it with, I tried to get as many people in that group. So I just said, okay, I'm going to do 30 sessions for free. And after that, I, I spent like 15 minutes calling around at that time to like who I could find was like the most expensive soft tissue person in Minnesota. Some guy was doing, I think ART was like 150 a session. I'm not sure how long the sessions were. So I'm like, okay, great. So I'm going to charge $200 a session then at the time. And so the first 30 people, I just kind of gave them a number and I said, okay, you know, once it hits 30, then it's going to be this, this amount of money. And I tried to get people who had kind of sort of a, a nocebo bias who are like, no, nah, this isn't going to work. I've tried everything like, great, come on in. Cause I'm like, if it happens to work on those people, there's probably something going on. Right. So there's probably at least some physiologic mechanism at work. If it's working in the face of a, a nocebo effect. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, most of those people saw pretty good results, like increase um, performance on a manual muscle test, which again, has its pros and cons. But at the time, I don't, so far, I haven't found anyone who's going to wheel a $60,000 biodex into my living room where I can do isokinetic testing or anything more on it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I've generally found that it's been, you know, out of all the I guess modalities I've done, I've found that it's been extremely effective. Um, now, again, you could say, yeah. Maybe I'm kind of biasing people in in one direction, and I'm only working with a subselect of uh, certain people who want to get better, which is probably true. But you know, a lot of those people have tried a whole bunch of other stuff too that also didn't seem to work. For sure. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good idea with uh, bringing in unbiased uh, subjects. That's something I did in my study. I made sure that no one had done RPR before uh, because I had a couple friends that I've shown them that and I'm like, ah, oh, sorry, you can't be in a study. You've seen it before. So I think that's an important point to make. Is there any negative effects from it? I know Cal has talked about some of the, uh, you know, parasympathetic effects of feeling really sluggish. Like he shifts people so far parasympathetically that they're really sluggish and uh, really sleepy. Um, I don't, I don't know if that would happen with RPR, but if you're someone that might be a high responder, maybe you'll feel um, like the first time you do it, you might feel some really different uh, sensations. Like for me, I I salivate. It's really, really odd that that's what I feel when I do RPR. Um, They say your vision might change a little bit so lights might be a little brighter um maybe to some people that could be concerning and i think they have like a, a health issue or something like that but um i think that just shows that that kind of gives you buying that maybe this is working and um it's affecting your nervous system in some form or fashion were you able to measure like heart rate or heart rate variability or any other measurements it's like non-invasive measurements I did not. Uh, just given the the time frame I had, sure. Uh, the the goniometry took long enough. Um, you know, twenty eight times three. That's you know almost 90, 90 sessions of about an hour. Um, so I was just literally living in the lab measuring goniometry. I got really good at goniometry. Um, oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my biggest concern was being reliable, making sure I you know, put the goniometer at the same spot every time. Um, And if you look at my placebo numbers, uh, it's nice because the numbers are similar, um, which is showing my reliability uh, to measure goniometry. And, you know, there wasn't any major variability with placebo, at least, um, which I was happy with. Did any of the subjects report that it was painful at all when they were doing it? So the acupressure point at the ear their hand would get tired, um, which is probably why um, their, their, I think their hand grip went down on one side, um, but not on the right. So again, that discrepancy between right and left again with acupressure. The, um, let me think here. The placebo was at the uh, VMO. So again, their hand was getting tired. Um, so the placebo hand grip was lower. Um, probably because their hands were getting tired, pressing so hard into their leg. 
um, I didn't tell them the press art. I just said, um, apply monarch to heavy pressure. So, you know, not trying to push so hard you can't do their hand, but you hold your hand someplace for five minutes, it's going to get a little tired. And so it was five minutes of pressing on the VMO as the placebo. Is that correct? Yes, that was the placebo, which I got from current literature um, from acupressure. That was the placebo, yeah. Got it. When they were doing the RPR, I've noticed that other people have reported certain areas can be painful. Um, was that something you just kind of would coach them through, or how did you kind of handle that, I guess? Yeah, I mean, uh, especially for the psoas reset, I would just ask them and be like, do you feel a hot spot? Because um, that usually will tell me if they're in the right spot of the psoas, and they're usually like, yes, I feel, you know, some there's some tenderness there. Um, so especially at that psoas reset, which is an inch to the right and down from the belly button on each side, um, that was really the biggest one that I found across the board people will have that, um, that tenderness at the, right at that stomach. Cool. Yeah. And I mean, similarly, I've noticed that with some people, they can become like almost overly parasympathetic, right? So if I have someone who's a higher level athlete, ideally I wouldn't do it right before a big game or anything they have. Cause one, you don't want to really change their nervous system if you're doing that. Um, two, usually I find if they're breathing patterns are really kind of stuck like the rib cage mechanics are not very good usually if we get those moving a lot better um, they do tend to down regulate pretty hard parasympathetically i've seen some pretty big changes in uh, resting heart rate heart rate variability the next day and probably not the best thing to do before they had a big event especially a speed and power type event um, but you know, most of them have reported that their sleep was a lot better that night. I mean, I've had a couple shift workers now who, I mean, the maximum they could sleep would be seven and a half hours, even if they had a string a couple of days off. Um, they've texted me the next day that they slept, you know, 10 to 11 hours for like the first time since they can remember. <laughs> wow. Um, and so pretty crazy stuff like that. Um, it can be quite painful though, especially if, uh, in the case of RPR, where you're working on areas of tissue that can be kind of stuck. Um, so I think that's probably at least what I've seen is probably the biggest negative is because a lot of the points are on areas that are pretty sensitive, right? You're looking at insertion of the ribs and the sternum area, you know, behind the head, potentially the jaw. Um, so that, I guess you could say is a negative some people are into that i guess but <laughs> um you can have some point uh tenderness and soreness the next day too which feels kind of weird it feels like that um like muscle soreness but kind of concentrated into small areas um so i often joke that i just did a session on someone a couple of days ago that she's like yeah I, I feel a lot better but i'm still kind of sore in places i'm like yeah it might I feel like a giant puts you in a sleeping bag and kind of beats you around the tree a little bit the next day. You can have this kind of weird kind of point tenderness, soreness too. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, I guess kind of similar to that, uh, the lim probably the largest limitation of my study was um, my subjects were general population. So some of the women were, you know, larger women. Um, so doing the shoulder reset around uh, the pectoral muscle, um, it's really, it was really tough of a challenge to get them, um, kind of pass that up into that breast tissue. There's only so much I can really do as a, you know, with the research scope that I had. Um, so maybe that could, the, the shoulder reset for the women wasn't up to, you know, the, the integrity that it should have been. Um, you know, I, I put that in my manuscript that, that's a potential challenge for RPR is how do we get the women to do the shoulder reset? Um, that's kind of a tough one I found. Um, so I just did my best there. Um, but you can do the, you know, stroking the side. That's part of the uh, shoulder reset. So I kind of made up for it there, I suppose. Did you have mostly females or males or was it split? Yeah, it was split right down the middle. It was uh, 15 females. 13 males, if I remember correctly. Okay. 
Was there enough statistical power to see if there's any difference per gender? Or I'm guessing you might be kind of underpowered to look at that, especially with the way the study was set up. Right. Per gender, probably underpowered. Um, but I was really happy with the 28 subjects that I got, um, which definitely lended enough statistical power. Um, so, yeah, I guess per gender, probably not. I would love to do a sex difference uh, study between men and women. That'd be, that'd be a cool one to do. Um, but again, you need a lot of subjects for that. Yeah. And anecdotally, what was the report back from the subjects? Did people sound like they were excited about doing it and wanted to continue doing it? Or what was just sort of the general feedback since you were obviously there for all of it? Yeah, so a good amount of the subjects, um, you know, wanted me to teach them a little more on RPR. Uh, they all wanted to know the results of the study. Uh, the biggest thing was there was probably four or five subjects that instantly knew they got better after doing the RPR. Hmm. They didn't, you know, it was a single blind study, so they didn't know what they got. But, you know, I had one kid, he only had about, you know, two degrees of shoulder extension. Um, oh, wow. And then he, yeah, so he was pretty locked up from, from football. And then he did the RPR and he had probably 20, 30 degrees. And he was hmm. like, oh my, oh my God, well, what just happened? So that was uh, a really cool thing to see. Um, and, you know, he wanted to know more about RPR after the study was done because he definitely felt it. Hmm. Any thoughts about what are the, cause one of the questions we get all the time is like, well, how, how does the RPR work, right? So if you look at your study and we say that, okay, it appears to be, you know, increasing range of motion in that, you know, study group of those, you know, confinements, like what is kind of the mechanism of how it's doing that? Sure. I kind of rely on the, um, this paper I pulled up from 2004 by Queso. It was the evaluation of Chapman reflexes. Mm -hmm. Chapman reflexes are kind of what RPR has come from um so a guy by the name of chapman and goodhart essentially looked at these pressure points um and speculated on you know what is happening and they call them neuro lymphatic resets um so the idea is that the, the neurological system and the lymphatic system are interlinked and if we are applying pressure to our body we're applying pressure to these lymph nodes and lymph vessels and that's removing some congestion and allowing the nervous system to function properly or in a better state um but from uh, this queso uh journal that i kind of relied heavily on in my paper they suggest that there's an increase in um muscle spindles so if we increase the you know the muscle spindle activation um, this would increase muscular tone, which would make sense for hip extension because you're required to really, um, it's not hip extension on the table when you're lying flat isn't really a measure of flexibility in my mind. It's more a measure of, um, you know, how well can I contract my glutes and hamstrings without raising my hip off the table? I guess that is kind of flexibility, but if you have better muscular tone, in better muscular activation, I can now raise my thigh higher off the table than I could prior. Um, and these are general population subjects, but some of them don't have much gluteus maximus and hamstring uh, strength anyways. Um, so that would make sense in my mind how they were able to significantly increase hip extension um, based on the muscle spindle theory. And on that test, was that an active test or was it a passive uh, test? So that was the active one. They were okay. lying, lying on the table and they had to raise their leg off the table. Um, I really wanted to make the tests similar to what they show in RPR. Sure. So the, the shoulder flexion is a big one and the hip extension is a big one. Those are really my two biggest uh, variables that I wanted to show. I did them all just for continuity but those were the, the big ones. Um, and that, you know, I think it's both, it's both flexibility and, uh, muscular, uh, activation. 
Yeah, and that always makes sense to my mind. I mean, I'm not a big fan of static stretching. I've written a bunch about it. I just, one, if you're doing the old school sit and reach hamstring test, there's a couple of studies showing that, one, we, we don't even know what you're stretching, right? Are you pulling on the muscle fiber? Are you pulling on the contractual elements inside like Titan? Are you pulling on the fascial system? Are you pulling on the vessels? You're probably doing all of it, right? Mm -hmm. Um and then some of the newer studies, not even new so much anymore, has showed that your the feedback loop to the brain actually gets altered, right? So if you think about the old school sit and reach, okay, sit and reach and then see how far you can get towards your toes and you go until you feel a significant stretch or a stretch that's an eight out of a one to 10 skill or however they equate it, they have you hold the static stretch, say for five rounds at 60 seconds each or whatever you're doing. And then when they measure you again, they're like, oh, wow, you got like a whole more, you got like another inch. But what they've shown in the studies is that your feedback from your nervous system is actually kind of my words is just getting dumber, right? You can get and push a little harder before you get the same level of feedback. Um, so yes, you do see a slight range of motion increase, but to me, I think you're adding an error into the loop of that, right? So if my shoulder is going back in a weird position where I'm getting close to my end range, I would want more information about where it is in space, not less. So I don't think all the time we have to kind of look at some of the studies to see, you know, what do they do? Is it better? Right. And also static stretching, if you're doing prolonged stretching, will decrease acutely speed and power some stuff in that area and just even just old school anecdotally like i don't i can rarely think of any clients that i'm just like yeah just go static stretch and it solved anything right sometimes you get lucky if they're like super type a and you can't get them to wind down then yeah we can do some static stretching after lifting or whatever might be helpful but was it static stretching was it just the change in their parasympathetic tone or or whatever i don't know what your thoughts are on static stretching yeah, I mean, I'm a distance runner, so you know, I've, ah. I'm well versed on the research on how that could be detrimental. Um, I like my hamstrings tight. You know, I mm -hmm. like that, uh, that elastic energy, that free elastic energy I'm getting from tight hamstrings. Um, but I guess kind of similar to that was the uh, the test retest. Um, one of my colleagues brought it up is, um, especially with RPR, you put your arm out to the side. The, you test the strength and then you retest, you know, did you, did you get stronger or did you anticipate that there was another test coming? Mm -hmm. um, so that was something I wanted to weave in the study I did was making sure, you know, I had the test retest, but I had the placebo. So, okay. RPR worked, but we got a placebo. Um, so I guess kind of similar to maybe like stretching, um, ideas the the test free test um you know not anticipating that what's coming is going to affect the result um, so did this person just simply reach back and get more shoulder flexion or did they actually increase shoulder flexion um that was the biggest concern with my study i'd say and what did you what would you conclude based on that and based on the work you did um, yeah, I would say that I was consistent in my measuring and I made sure that people weren't compensating, especially with the shoulder flexion one. So they're on their back. They could easily just arch their back and gain more shoulder flexion, but I made sure to be consistent in how people could, uh, skew the result. And yeah, I would say RPR works for shoulder flexion and hip extension, um, for sure in this in this setting um what i would like to do next is is rpr better than a dynamic warm up so we do you know rpr with a dynamic warm up dynamic warm up group and then um and then just an rpr group so it would be three groups um so it's like all right we have some evidence that rpr could increase flexibility is it better than a warm up is it better with a warm up um because that was my colleague's uh, next question was, what's better? You know, it, should I 
is it better than warm up? Should I just spend my time doing a dynamic warm up or should I spend my time doing this? So I think that's the next question that's got to be answered here. And what would the kind of output measurement of that be? Would you have them do some type of performance test or range of motion or how would you kind of quantify what would be better? I think a mix of both would be nice. Um, so have some goniometry, goniometer measures. I wouldn't, I wouldn't need 12 or 11 like I had before, but maybe two flexibility measures and then two performance variables, either uh, a one rep max on the, or five rep, one rep or five rep on the, uh, on a machine or some kind of squat press. And then some kind of you know, bench press or bench machine. So we get some lower body and upper body with flexibility. And that'd be, that'd be really nice to, to show that it, is there strength gains in strength? Because if I can show that RPR increases hand grip strength, well, hand grip strength can correlate to upper body strength. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that makes sense to me that I could potentially grab a, you know, maybe a larger dumbbell and now I can, my hand grip's not limiting me and I can row a heavier dumbbell or I can row heavier on a machine or, or press heavier. Um, that's how I see it. Yeah. And if anyone just tried the inverse, right. Take like a pair of like fat grips or use like a two inch smooth axle bar to do deadlifts and you'll fast realize that once your brain realizes you can't hold on to it, like it's the weirdest sensation that you can't really move. It's just it's like, you don't see people's hips come up early. You don't see anything. They just look like they got zapped by a, a lightning bolt and they got frozen in place. So I always thought that was just kind of fascinating and everyone's had the inverse experience too, where they, maybe they're just doing, you know, deadlifts on a normal bar, you know, in their warmups, they're like, Oh, wow, that was pretty fast. And it just feels like you're more connected to the implement almost always seems to translate into better performance for most people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, hand grip is definitely a limiter, um, in a lot of weight room activities, especially with women. Uh, so that, that would be huge that if we could increase hand grip four or five pounds, Hey, we can, we can row five pounds heavier and your hand grip's not going to limit you. Cool. So are you able to do the next study or are you just kind of graduating and moving on or what's next for you? Yeah. So I got one more year in the graduate program. So it would be a thesis. So the initial study I did was for, you know, just a research class, this, this next, you know, would be the dynamic warm up versus RPR. That would be a, a thesis um, with a lot of subjects and a lot of time in the weight room in the research lab. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to putting it together. Very cool. And this uh, current study, is this under review or are you in the process of it being submitted or kind of where is it at in the process? So what I plan to do is uh, present this in the fall at ACSM, the ACSM conference in new england and right after i present it i will submit it in to get published to either the uh this journal i have here probably the strength conditioning journal um, okay jscr yeah so because you can't present uh uh published papers at acsm i suppose mm. and i'd really like to present this in front of a large group that has no idea what RPR is and would be very skeptical about it. Cool. Awesome. So what are your plans once you, once you graduate? Yeah. So I have uh, probably two different roads I'd go with this. Uh, road number one would be uh, cardiac rehab, um, getting in the clinical setting of exercise physiology um, or looking for, you know, coaching opportunities in either the weight room um, or at the collegiate level for track. I think that'd be um, two different roads I could go. Um, still kind of figuring it out, but I, I think it's going to depend on the opportunities that arise for me. Awesome. And then do you still do RPR on yourself today? What have you kind of noticed in your own end of one experience with it? Yeah, so I still do RPR uh, just before I work out. Um, I find that's sufficient for me and I know everyone's a little different. Um, so I do it before I work out. I still salivate every time I hit 
uh, the occipital and so as, hmm. um, so there's something about that, you know, everyone's a little bit different and, uh, yeah, I'll still feel my Achilles every now and then. And that's when I know, all right, time to do the calf reset. And once I do that calf reset, it clears it up right away. And it's, it's just incredible to me. Hmm. Um, but it's, then I've had someone ask me, is it really Achilles tendonitis or is it kind of your mind maybe playing tricks on you? And it kind of like, I'm trying to like cast doubt maybe. Um, but then I remember, remembered back to how my original Achilles tendonitis felt. And it felt, feels exactly like it does when I feel my Achilles from, you know, all the mileage I do and, you know, hard running. When I feel my Achilles, it's exactly like the Achilles tendonitis initially felt. So I'd have to tell them, you know, I think RPR works on tendonitis. That'd be a whole new can of worms uh, for a study. Yeah, and that gets into what is tendonitis, what is tendinosis, what is tendinopathies. Like there's some, the general kind of overview would say that tendonitis is a irritation, but it's more inflammation related. Tendinosis would be more of a scrambling of the local connective tissue, collagen fibers, et cetera. I, I don't know. I'd have to go back and look to see what that's actually based on. Right. Cause you'd have to do obviously some dissection or animal work or something in that area. I don't know if you could pick up anything on imaging, but at the end of the day, a lot of the, I think the stuff people are dealing with are just based on what does a person present as their symptoms. Right. And if the symptoms got better, yeah, from a clinician standpoint, cool. Like you did your job from a research standpoint, then you would probably want to know, okay, what is the mechanism? What is actually, you know, different at that point? And that gets to be a little bit trickier, I think, to, to figure out too. Right. You know, in future research, you'd have to find an athlete that would already have tendonitis or some, some form. And then I don't know how necessarily that would work. Um, if there'd be any ethical issues with that, I'm not sure. Um, but that would be really cool if I could, if you could see it happen on athletes. So we have an athlete with, you know, you know, tennis elbow or Achilles tendonitis and we do the resets. Did it work? Did it not work? Um, I think it'd be a really cool study. Yeah. It's just, I mean, my experience on that just anecdotally with RPR would be activated is if someone is really kind of overcompensating with grip, right? So if you watch them doing kind of a lower body ish exercise where their hands are kind of free, do they kind of squeeze one hand more than another hand? A lot of times I've noticed that's the side that has more to what they report as like a tendinopathy. And usually if we get them to work better, right? So we get the muscle activation we want just by manual muscle tests and their hand can stay open. Most of the time I've noticed their tendinopathy or whatever it was seems to go away pretty fast. Now, again, I don't think that's all cases. You're definitely going to have some people who've got just probably poor inflammation status to begin with. You definitely have some people who have overuse injuries. Um, but so what I do is I'll check with, for that first. And then a lot of times I just have them do the direct opposite. And so I have a client now where, uh, like the bottom part of her elbow is painful doing a dumbbell bench press. So she's doing a lot of rowing now, but instead of having her palm down, it's actually her palm is facing up playing with her elbow. Um, so I found just by changing the mechanical loading, a lot of times you can circumvent a lot of those cases too. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, well, what's the root cause of it? You know, that's, that's another really good point. Yeah. Cool. So would you recommend people learn more about RPR in the meantime then? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many different, you know, avenues you can go with RPR. Um, you know, it, it can affect vision. So you can you do certain colors and do the resets. There's parts of your vision um, or you might have, uh, I forget what they call it, but where your nervous system uh, has past trauma. So you do a little, eye test and the the nervous system had trauma there and that's where, kind of where your nervous system uh, shuts down i don't like to say that they, they say that a lot in rpr that your nervous system shuts down 
Um, I get a lot of flack from that with my colleagues. Um, but that's the idea is that there's this past trauma from maybe a fall or an injury or a, or a hit in football or some, something like that. And uh, you have this vision trauma that you could correct with RPR. Um, and there's RPR with sleep. And there's, it's a very wide range of topics just from one kind of method, which I find really interesting and just makes me want to study it more. Yeah, I've done a fair amount of visual resets on people. Uh, I've had a lot of, I don't know what they've had for their past history. I only know going off of just an oral history of what they report. And sometimes people don't remember even traumas and everything else that they've had happen. Um, but always, my general thought process with that is, if I, so one guy was a goalie, he got hit on the side of the face with a puck. If you're, if you believe your body is organized for survival, then your body's going to want to do everything possible in order to survive. So for him getting hit on the side of the face, moving his eyes to the right, being in that position is probably going to be pretty threatening, right? Because his brain's going to go, oh yeah, I remember the last time we were here in this position, some really, really bad shit happened to us. So let's kind of avoid that and let's not go there as much as possible. And a lot of times those sort of movements or reflexes or whatever word you want to use associated with it they're unconscious a lot of times so people don't know that they're they're there which is why i think some form of testing can be helpful right so in rpr be activated you can put people back into those positions and then uh, try to do some of the resets on them you know there's other modalities like emdr where they're trying to do lateral eye movements to try to you know change the intensity of it so it's probably multiple different ways you could address it too yeah it's the list goes on there's so many different pathways you can take rpr i find um either you know from all the ways we talked about today awesome and where can people find out more about you uh so my i work at plymouth state so you can contact the plymouth state athletics department i also work at a gym called fit focus in laconia new hampshire uh, so you can look me up online there uh, also my instagram is warren underscore workouts you can see kind of the stuff i post there future research uh see my workouts <laughs> um yeah those are the main ways to really uh reach out to me and uh feel free to shoot me a message on you know, especially on any current research with acupressure or RPR, because I'll be doing a lot more on that. Um, yeah, any any peer-reviewed research on acupressure would greatly be appreciated in potential physiological mechanisms. Maybe there's one I haven't heard. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, I mean, that's what really advances uh, new topics like this is conversation and networking. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all your time today and uh, sharing your research. And thank you so much for doing and performing all the research because I know that definitely is very time intensive. And yeah, it's uh, not an easy thing to do. So thank you so much for doing all that. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to be here and glad to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Flex Diet podcast here today. Hopefully you enjoyed our discussion on RPR, Reflexive Performance uh, Reset. If you have any questions or comments or anything, uh, when we post this on the old social media, uh, Instagram especially, you can leave them there below and I will do my best to get back to you as soon as I can. And shameless plug, if you are looking for RPR to be taught at your facility, um, I do teach on occasion. If you can get enough people together, you could even request me as your instructor and it's a lot of fun i've been honored to teach it in you know everywhere from around the u.s north america to even as far away as australia so uh, it actually is really fun you can get a lot out of just even the level one and level two over the two days and you can go obviously to the rpr website we'll have all the links uh, below here for you to check out today we're sponsored by the physiologic flexibility cert so this is all the information that I put together on how to enhance your ability to recover, to be more resilient, and just overall more anti-fragile. 
uh, everything from breathing techniques to cold and hot pH changes, such as high intensity uh, intervals, and even your fuel system. So we did a very deep dive on the use of ketones and carbohydrates. And along the way, we include some interesting supplements uh, that can help you and different tips and techniques. So it's not currently open right now, but you can go to physiologicflexibility.com, get on the wait list, and we'll provide you a lot more information in the meantime, and you'll be the first to be notified as soon as it opens. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you to Warren for coming on here to discuss some brand new research on RPR. If you enjoyed this, please forward it on to somebody else. Thank you so much, and I will talk to you again next week. Is that a toupee you're wearing or did your cat die? No. <laughs>